I know all of you have many questions, but those questions will be addressed on the third day. So I want to be very clear. Today is only philosophy of the body, meaning let us take a secular approach to sexuality. Let us try to understand, to think about sexuality in a, in a very uh, neutral way. Next day, we'll talk about theology of the body. And only when we are equipped with these two sets of knowledge, then we can address the particular Catholic or Christian issues. And then we'll talk about not prostitution, because that we will talk about that today, but premarital sex or contraception and everything you want. So on the first session, I'm going to try to answer the things, I, the questions I think you will have. And the second part of the third session, I will be taking any question from the floor. So for today, I want just to be clear. So I will, if we have time at the end, I will ask for clarifications. Anything I didn't, uh, you think you didn't understand, I can rephrase or try to, 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 to explain again. But the big questions that I know you, all of you have, because everybody has, okay, um, will be addressed on the third day. For today, I will just want to make you aware that the way you are thinking and the way many people are thinking is not as free, it's as neutral as people like to think. Okay? That we are all very much influenced by philosophers that died many years ago. But the ideas are still very much alive in our culture. So in the case of René Descartes, I was explaining, he influenced Western culture very much. Um, and with Western culture comes these ideas they are very much linked with our understanding of sexuality. So, two ideas so far. My body is me, and the other idea is my body communicates. So now we have to be aware that when we communicate, we communicate, we may communicate something that is true or something that is false. And if we communicate something that is false intentionally, what is that? How do we call that? A lie, right? So how do lies work? Um, lies work because we are intelligent. That girl is very intelligent. It means, to be intelligent means that you can use things for other purposes. So people don't write books for people to stamp of them. But if you cannot reach uh, to your favorite iPhone, then if you are smart, you can use books to do that, right? That is what she is doing. So we can add a new purpose to things. We can add a new purpose to books. Books are not meant to stand on them, but we can do that. We are intelligent creatures, okay? And that is what makes us lie. So let us take a very typical example. The, guy, the boy that cried wolf. What did he do? What does wolf mean in that context? In that context, it means there is a wolf attacking my flock, right? In that context, okay? So he's an intelligent boy, and he said, I'm going to have some fun. I'm going to use this with another purpose. The purpose is to have, to, to entertain himself. Why? Because people are going to believe me, they are going to come to help me, and then I will laugh at them. And he's lying because there is no wolf. Okay, when you say something and it is not a fact, and you do that intentionally, then you are lying. Even if you are doing, for, you are doing it for other purpose. Okay? And as a matter of fact, this is what is important in this case, that he is, when he says wolf, even if there is no wolf, the message is transmitted. That's why people come. So he is transmitting a message. Okay. So, if we can communicate with our bodies and we can lie with our communication, it means that our bodies can lie. And there is an example in history, most of you will recognize that picture from Giotto. It is the betrayal of Jesus. So, what does a kiss mean? Kiss usually means it's an expression, it's a part of the cultural language, it's an expression of friendship, for example, depending on the culture, it is a cultural expression, right? But in the case of Judas, or in the case of, uh, that is mentioned in the, in the Gospels, Judas added another purpose to the kiss. What is the purpose? 
the man I will kiss is the man you should apprehend. So, what was Judas doing when he kissed Jesus? Was he expressing his affection for Jesus? He was, he was doing precisely the opposite. He was betraying Jesus. And that is why Jesus reacted. And he said, with a kiss, are you betraying your master? He wanted to point out that what you do, your gesture, what your body is doing, and what your mind is doing, are totally different things and opposite things. So that's the, um, what I, I mean. Kisses has a fixed and determined meaning according to our uh, cultural language. It's a, a communication of affection. In Judas case, there was a contradiction between the meaning of kisses and the use of this kiss. So Judas lied with his body. So this is the second aspect. Our bodies communicate for us intimacy when they use the sexual language. But our minds can add new meanings with purpose. Or we can add a new purpose to this. Or intentionally on purpose. And when we add a new purpose to the language of our body, it sends the fixed meaning it is meant to communicate. So if somebody was looking at Judas' kiss from afar, they would understand, oh, they are friends. Because you are, Judas was still sending his message. And because that friendship was not there, that friendship was not a fact. The fact was that he was betraying Jesus. He was, Judas was lying with his body. So if what the fixed meaning of the body expresses is not a fact, we are lying with our bodies. So that's not very philosophical, right? It's quite, quite obvious. Okay, that's good. And then, so let us recap a little bit for the sake of clarity. My body is mine, that is the first paradigm. And that means my body only communicates what my mind decides. This is what most people think, okay? Because if your body is the tool of your mind, it obeys blindly to what your mind is saying. But in the other paradigm, my body is me, it means that my body communicates for me. And my body remembers for me, and my body understands for me. Okay? That my body communicates for me. Um, another way of uh, illustrating this comes from another movie, this time uh, much more modern, Vanilla Sky. And you have a couple played by Cameron Diaz and uh, Tom Cruise. So they are dating and they break up and she starts dating somebody else. And she complains. And she gets very mad and then he doesn't understand that. And he says, why are you upset? We were together, we had sex, but now we are not together and I have another girlfriend. And then she says this very interesting sentence for, Hollywood, for a Hollywood movie. Don't you know that when you sleep with someone, your body makes a promise whether you do or not? So what promise is she talking about? Isn't that more in line with the understanding that my body is mine, or more in line with understanding that my body is me? And therefore, when it speaks, it speaks for me, even if I intend to lie, because it still sends the message. We continue to apply this to the two paradigms, my mind, my affection, my body, my sexual organs, that would be the sandwich there. And the other one is body and mind are rolled into one with different inner layers, so uh, that has to do with the understanding of sexuality. Remember this sentence that we hear a lot. It is only sex. What people mean by that is there is no love, and love is the thing that is personal. So if it is only sex, sex what they mean, it is nothing personal. Okay. If that is true, every time people are having sex, they will have to decide what it means. Because it doesn't mean anything by itself. It only means what your mind means. If your body has nothing to say, and the meaning comes only from the mind, I hope you understand this, then any sexual act will be totally meaningless in itself, because the meaning comes from the mind. So you have to explain this. When I hug a child, I don't have to explain anything because his body understands me. But if I do something that he doesn't understand, he will be very confused and he will have to ask, what are you doing? Okay? And he will say, oh, in my country we do this and means this. If you go to America, 
instead of shaking hands, they do a strange things with your hands. You, you give them the hand and they start to slap it around and uh, move it up and down and, uh, so, uh, until they finish. You have to stay there until they finish. Okay? So I don't understand that. They, they have to explain it to me. This is what we do. Oh, okay. okay. Why? Because that has no meaning in itself. The meaning it has is because that culture put it there. But if we believe that my body is me and my body communicates for me and it has a meaning in the dictionary of the, la of the, of the language of the body, then I don't need to explain anything. This is what it means. I may use it for other purposes or I may use it and I know that this union is not the case. I don't want to be united. I just want to earn money. I just want to have fun. I just want to do whatever. If that union is not the case, then I would be lying with my body. Because my body is saying something in my mind, and that is not the case. And my mind is using it for another purpose. So I hope that, has, that is uh, a bit clear. So let me explain how many people think about sexuality today. Um, once again, we go back to this paradigm that my, my mind can decide what my body is expressing. I call this the theory of the switch. It works like this, okay? That sex has no meaning, and when two people love each other, then it means that we love each other, and if people don't love each other, they just, it doesn't mean anything. Okay? That is the case with uh, other activities, okay? For example, having dinners. Having dinners is, has no meaning in itself, but we can add meaning to that. So a couple who are in love may have this unforgettable dinner and they put candles and they put their favorite music and they say this is a very nice intimate dinner and we will remember this dinner for the rest of our lives. But that intimacy or that meaningfulness is something they put in it because the following day those same persons may be having dinner with total strangers and the other party is not going to complain. How dare you have dinner with total strangers? Okay. So, as I said, the theory of the switch goes like this. That because sex has no meaning, or if, if it has some meaning, my mind can remove that meaning at will. I can switch on and off the intimacy or the meaningfulness of sex. Okay. Now, once again, this is something that is very tempting for many people to believe. But you have to be consistent. Okay, obviously, we are not going to find a microscope that goes into the human body and, and finds the switch. But we can push the theory that if this switch does exist, if our mind really has this capacity to choose how meaningful sex is, that everybody would have the switch. Right? There is no reason why you should have it and I don't. And everybody could use the switch. There is no reason why at one time you can use a switch, and other time you cannot. So if this were true, a married couple could say in the morning, perhaps, honey, I'm very tense now, I'm going to have sex with that taxi driver over there. Don't worry, it's not going to be anything personal. I will make sure I switch off the meaningfulness and intimacy of this sexual act is going to be just sex. And what I do with you at night, that will be real, meaningful, intimate sex. And the husband will say, no worries, I stand here, read the newspaper, have breakfast. Make sure that you don't take more than 10 minutes and that you switch off the meaningfulness of this act. If the theory of the switch were true, we will be having as many people having meaningless sex as people are having meaningless dinners. And people wouldn't complain about meaningless sex as people don't complain about other people or their partners having meaningless dinners. Is that the case? Or perhaps is the case that there is no such a switch, but we like to believe that it exists and that at some point, sometimes, some people have the power to use it. So if we use the other paradigm, my body is me, an intimate expression of the body always conveys an intimate expression of the person. 
whether the person wants it or not. That is what it means. Another thing is what is whether it is true. And we should not confuse the two. You may not. It may, it may not be the case, as in, the, the, in, so many, in so many examples, that that union is not truly there. But that is what your body is saying, whether you like it or not. So that's the second idea. So just let us go back to our uh, crossroad. The token path says, my mind decides how intimate the intimacy of the body is. I can decide that one sexual act is totally meaningless and another is fully intimate and personal. And the intimacy of the body stands for my intimacy always. And this intimate union of the bodies communicates the intimate union of the persons always, even if the mind adds a new purpose to it, or even if the mind realizes that it is not true, that that, is, that union is not the case. So that's the second idea. So how many ideas so far? Two. The first, the body is me. The second one, my body communicates. If we went, if we, if we want to make it a little bit more complicated, my body is me, and the intimacy of which means that the intimacy of my body stands for the intimacy of the person. It stands for my intimacy. And then the second idea is our body communicates. If we want to move the argument a little bit further, the intimate language of the body always expresses intimacy, whether you mean it or not, whether it is true or not. So now the, other, the last idea is that we are persons, and persons have a personal dimension. Okay. This is a bit easier to understand, I think. Okay, tools exist for a purpose. And if this is a, this is a tool, and the moment it doesn't fulfill its purpose, it is totally useless. Okay? But there are some things that don't have a further purpose. And those things we call persons. And this is why we cannot utilize persons. We cannot use persons. And if you feel used, how does it feel? Does it feel very good that you have been useful to society? Not really. Okay? So we perceive spontaneously, and this is the only ethical aspect that when I'm going to mention today, that uh, there is something wrong about treating people like tools, treating people like instruments. Okay? And this is why, for example, slavery is wrong. Okay? In this, when you take a slave, you are using that slave for your own purposes, without his consent. Okay? You are using a person as Persons use animals, okay? So the fact that we are persons means a few things. One of them is uh, that we are the owners of our lives and that makes us that we are ends in ourselves. It means that we don't need to be justified for another purpose, for another further purpose, okay? The existence of this microphone is justified by the fact that it is useful for you to hear me. The moment that purpose disappears, this microphone is useless. In its existence, will be totally pointless. Will be meaningless. It has no purpose. All right. But we don't do that with people. We say, what is? People have are ends in themselves, purposes in themselves, and because they are intelligent and we are the owners of our lives, we should do things for our own benefit, for our own good. All right. We are unique, that means that we are, precisely because we have this capacity to rule our lives, that gives us a kind of uniqueness that other animals don't have and that we like to respect. Okay? So treating persons as objects or means to other ends is demeaning their dignity. Okay? So it means that we have a higher dignity than other things. Because we are ends in ourselves and we, because we are subjects of our lives, when we are treated as mere objects or as means to other ends, we are degraded in our dignity. And we feel it, and we don't like it. If someone tells you, invite you for coffee, and after coffee he says, oh, by the way, since you are here, why don't you uh, bring me, since you have a car and I don't, why don't you bring me to such and such place? You say, sure. 
But if you found out that that person invited you for coffee only because you have a car, and he doesn't have a car, and he didn't tell you this, and you find out later, how do you feel? You feel used. Why didn't you tell me? I would have said yes. Once we take a purpose and we make it our own, we are not used anymore because that is the purpose that we have chosen and accepted and, and, and agreed to. Okay? So let me be a bit more uh, clear here. So imagine that I die. Okay? So if I die, probably my mother will come to my funeral. Okay? So my mother hopefully will be very sad. Uh, and then you try to console her. Right? And you tell my mother, don't worry, because there are 150 priests in Singapore, and any can do the job of your son even better. So the question is, would my mother be very consoled? What do you think? Hopefully not, right? So why is that? That is the case because in a personal relationship with my mother, I cannot be substituted, because I'm unique, I'm a person. As a priest, I can be substituted. As a teacher, we can be substituted because those are not personal relationships. A personal relationship is a relationship in which you stand as the unique person you are. Even my brother cannot substitute me as the son of my mother. He is also the son of my mother, that's why he's my brother. <laughs> but he cannot substitute me. Friends, marriage, children and parents, those are personal relationships. We cannot be substituted because in these relationships we stand as the unique as persons, which means as the unique individuals we are. So that's the difference. There is a difference between impersonal and impersonal relationships according to my understanding of pers personhood. You can go to NTUC and buy things and you don't need to know the name of the lady who is helping you and if tomorrow another lady is there, you don't care. There is an impersonal transaction there. You give her money, she gives you fruits or milk or rice. And as long as those transactions are fair, everything is okay. So what we are exchanging is something impersonal. In personal relationships, what we exchange is a bit of ourselves, is something personal. What my mother and I exchange with one another is something of the uniqueness of the uniqueness we are. Okay. So that's the difference between the two. And we will talk about that perhaps on the, on the last day, but for now, we need to remember these things. So persons have this personal dimension. And not only it is wrong to use persons without telling them, without them embracing and accepting and consenting to the end we want to, 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 uh, them to, 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 to fulfill. Okay? But what is personal should never be used as well. So let me give you an example. Okay? Marriage, as we said, is a personal relationship. Two persons stand as the unique individuals they are. So do you think is it okay? for two persons to get married so that they can have a specific nationality. I don't know if it doesn't work for Singapore, but in other countries, if you marry a person of that country, you become a citizen of that country. So would that be all right to use marriage for other purposes? Or would it be something that is immoral and even illegal? And why is it illegal? It is illegal because you are using something personal for other purpose. And it doesn't matter that the purpose is good. To have Singapore nationality is something good, I'm sure. But to use something personal to attain that is degrading the personhood of marriage. It's treating it like a tool for other ends. Okay? So I'm going to push this argument a little bit further. And with this, we are very close to the, to the end. So personal is what is personal. It's an end in itself. It must never be utilized or used for any other purpose. Because it has a purpose. Marriage is a purpose in itself. When you get married, you don't tell the other, why did you get married? What, what is the purpose of this marriage? The purpose of this marriage is marriage, to stay together. Okay? It is an end in itself. It is something personal. 
So it turns out that uh, what is intimate necessarily needs to be personal. If what is intimate is not personal, then nothing is. Okay. So personal is a wider concept than intimacy. So intimacy in, in the, the origin of the word comes from latter from Latin. Uh, it means innermost. So the intimacy of the body and its language is always personal too. Precisely because it is intimate, it is necessarily personal. So the innermost dimension of the person must be personal. And with this, uh, we can put some things together. Our minds, we said before, can add new purposes to things, but adding a new purpose to the language of intimacy is treating something personal as if it were impersonal, demeaning and degrading it. That's what we said. If you treat marriage as a tool for other ends, you are demeaning its dignity. So if we have been saying that the intimacy of the body stands for the intimacy of the person, and, this, and therefore it is personal, because it's personal, should not be used for other purposes, because if you do, you demean it, then sexuality and the sexual language of the body should not be used for other purposes, other than the purpose it has in itself. And with this, we finish the third point, and we are nearly finished. So the trodden path, the trodden path says, I can decide that one sexual, we said this before, just to stress the point, that one sexual act is totally meaningless and another is fully intimate and personal according to your mind. And therefore, sex is personal only when you decide so. That's what we tend to believe if you embrace the understanding that the body is only something you have. The alternative path, if that is not true and you know, the body is something we are, then the, the intimate union of the bodies communicates the intimate union of the persons always, even if the mind wants to add something to it. And the sexual language of the body is always personal and using it for purposes other than its fixed meaning is demeaning and degrading it. So how many ideas do we have so far? We finished already? So the first idea was, my body is me, the second idea is, my body communicates, and the second idea is, what is personal must never be utilized, treated like a tool. So what happens if we put these three ideas together? The intimacy of the body stands for the intimacy of the person, first idea, the second idea, the body speaks for us with its own unchangeable language, and what is personal must never be treated as means to other ends. If we put this together, it makes this is perfectly consistent. The sexual aspect of the body is always personal and intimate and communicates a personal and intimate union. It must never be used as a tool. It must never be utilized as means to other ends. And if this is true, now we have an answer. Okay, a prostitute uses the intimacy of her body for commercial purposes, Treating what is personal and intimate makes it impersonal and superficial. Utilizing what is personal and intimate is a violation of the personal dignity of the person. And that's why prostitution is probably wrong. But all of you knew this. But none of you told me this. And that's my point today. This is what I really want to show you. That we live in a culture that has, that has stolen the reasons we have to explain what we think is wrong. Most of you thought it was wrong. Actually, let us be honest, all of you thought it was wrong. How many of you would be so happy to say, yes, my sister is a prostitute and is the best prostitute in Singapore? Okay. But why can't we why we cannot formulate these ideas? And the reason is because our culture has taken the language away from us. We cannot formulate it because we don't have the language. And even if these truths are very deep in ourselves, and there is some reason why, and many of you hinted of this. Some people sp spoke about uh, commerce, uh, exchanging uh, merchandise or something like that, um, the dignity of the body. Some of you were talking about those things. All those things hint hit around the bushes of the issue, but doesn't go inside the issue. 
And the reason is because, as I said before, all these ideas have been taken away from us. And therefore, we are deprived of this. I know very well that this session was a bit heavy <laughs> for a normal, average, working Singaporean that has been working the whole day and comes here and listens to two hours of philosophy. I don't need you to remember all these things. I want just to make you aware of what is going on in our societies and in our culture. But there is a dogma out there, so let me just conclude. Okay? That the difficulty to accept the teachings of the church on love and sensuality has nothing to do with the church, but with our culture, with a shift in understanding of morality and the meaning of the human body. And that is what needs to be addressed. I know you came here for me to talk about the theology of the body, and I will. But before we even go into that, because if I go into that without passing through this, we are going to come away with the same conclusion. All these things are wrong because the church says so. Yes, the church says so, and there, is a, there are reasons why the church says so. And we, we need to know the reasons. So the reason why we cannot formulate these things is because today's culture presents us with two cultural dogmas. One, the body is simply a tool of your mind, and your mind can use it as a child plays with a toy. And the other idea is that morality depends only on the consequences of your actions, and if what you do has no bad implications or no bad consequences, then it should be tolerated. If that is the case, most sexual behavior that is consented and protected has no bad consequences and it should be tolerated. Okay. So it is time to be a bit more critical about the dogmas of our culture. Many people complain that the church is dogmatic. Chesterton famously said that there are two kinds of people. The people who believe in dogmas and they know where they come from. And people who believe in dogmas and they don't know where they come from. And there are cultural dogmas. A dogma is something you ac accept without questioning. When I came here and I, if I had asked you, do you think your body is something you have or something you are, you would have looked very perplexed to me and say, I don't know what you are talking about. Yes, my body is something I have. It is a dogma that we have come to accept without questioning. So we hope that after this session we are less dogmatic. Not only in imposing our dogmas to other people, but also in being critical about the dogmas that our cultures are imposing on us without thinking. So it is time, I think, to be more critical and start to challenge the dogmas we are asked to accept and search for a better understanding of the human body and human sexuality. So I actually only solve the problem of prostitution, which I know you don't have, okay? But, and there are other problems other questions you have, premarital sex, I know you have questions about homosexual sex and all these things, but we cannot even start to talk about those things if we don't start with a good, solid foundation. All those questions, all those issues will have no question, no, no, no issue, if you start thinking that the body is you, because then, yes, sex is meaningful only if your mind agrees to that, and if two people in love they do naturally what nature pushes them to do, which is express that affection with sexual acts. Yes, premarital sex is okay. And yes, homosexual sex is okay because those two people also love each other. The question then is, is sex only an expression of affection? Or is something else? And those questions we'll have to address on the last, on the last day. But from, from today, I hope we can understand what is behind the scenes. And it takes time to understand that. And it took me two hours just to answer one simple question that you knew the answer from the beginning, but you couldn't tell me. So I hope after today, you're gonna start thinking about these issues in another light. Now all this resistance of the world to the church has nothing to do with the church lagging behind the times, it has something to do with a philosopher of the 17th century who has died, who didn't have any proof to say that the body is something we have, and once he planted it in Western culture, everybody has come to accept it without questioning. 
And there are very good reasons to question that. At least I have for myself very good reasons to question it. There is something we call in the church natural law. A natural law is grossly misunderstood. Okay, so I'm going to give you an example. One of the, the answers people often give me is prostitution is not the purpose of sex. So because she's using it for another purpose, she's doing something wrong. Okay? That's a very old argument. And it is not a very sound argument. It is an argument from many catechists. Okay? Thomas Aquinas in the 13th century already said that uh, it is not a valid argument. And he explains it very well. He said, are hands for walking? Do you think that the purpose of the hand is walking? No, right? So if I walk on my hands, am I committing a mortal sin? No. Are feet for painting? So if I paint a painting with my feet, am I committing a mortal sin? So it doesn't depend, depends on what you mean by the laws of nature. That yes, we can read the purpose of nature, but we change that purpose with our minds all the time. Okay? It is not wrong to do that. If you have a problem with your track, track and you cannot breathe, a doctor will cut a hole there and make you breathe through the trachea. Is the trachea meant to inhale? No, it's the nose is meant for that. But doctors can do that to save your life. There is nothing wrong in changing the purpose of nature. We are called by God specifically to, to rule nature with the rule of reason. So that's why I don't use that example. We have to go through the meaning of the body and the issue that lying is immoral and degrading the dignity of things is immoral. When I walk in my hands, I don't degrade, I don't degrade the dignity of hands because my hands are not something personal and intimate, just like my feet. And that is that makes a whole difference. When I gave the example of the lady giving massage, which I always use on purpose, and gets people very confused, people say, yeah, it is the same. One is using the body, the other one is using the body. You can use your hands to help clients because the hands are not something very intimate and very personal. So the image of the spiral that I offered at the beginning is crucial to understand all these things. That we are not like sandwiches, we are like sushi rolls. We have layers of intimacy and that applies not only to the mind, it applies to the body as well. And that piece in the puzzle is crucial to understand everything. Someone was telling me, what if you don't believe that? What if you don't believe that the body, uh, that the body is something we are? What if you insist that the card was right and the card, uh, and yes, the body is simply the tool of our minds? There are two answers. First of all, that you cannot be Christian and believe that, even if René Descartes was Christian, for the fact that believing that the body is part of ourselves, is part of our faith, is not only just a superficial part, it's the very essence of our faith. Christianity was born when Mary Magdalene was, went to the tomb and the body of Jesus was not there. But the body of Jesus was not there meant that Jesus was not there. Jesus, after his resurrection, insisted in convincing his disciples that he was not a ghost, that he was himself. How do you prove that? My body, the body of Jesus is Jesus. And that has become part, intrinsic part of our faith. Every Sunday after the homily, you stand up and profess your creed. And at the end of the creed, you say you believe in the resurrection of the flesh, of the body. Why? Because I cannot be me without my body. Just like Descartes said, I can be me without my body, Thomas Aquinas in the, 13th, in the 13th century said, long, long, long time before the card said that, I am not my soul. It sounds very surprising to Catholics, to Christians. And it sounds very surprising to you because perhaps you are more Cartesian than you are Thomistic. But what Thomas Aquinas was saying is that for me to be complete, I have to wait and to recover my body. And this is what is genuinely Christian. Every religion out there believes that the soul is immortal and that your soul will go to some kind of heaven or paradise. We not only believe that with other religions, unlike any other religion, we believe in the resurrection of the flesh. 
than the, in the new heavens and the new earth, after the final judgment, we will be complete. And complete means we will have our bodies. Spiritual bodies, a bit more complicated than you want me, not material, physical bodies, but bodies nonetheless. So that's one thing why this belief that the body is something I have is something that is very consistent with Catholic faith. As a matter of fact, the opposite is inconsistent with the Catholic faith. But we can make the argument, since we have time, that I'm not Catholic, I don't care about the resurrection of the body. I am the grand grandchild of Descartes and I like his argument. There are scientific reasons that helps us to suspect that the body is more than the tool of the mind. But I don't want to bring that here now. There are other things you can do. And it's when you cannot convince, when there are no proofs, mathematical proofs or reasonable proofs, the least we can demand from each other if we want a dialogue is consistency. So what would happen if René Descartes' ideas that my body is me is true? You can push that to the extreme. And I was explaining that before. Imagine there is a rape. There is this rapist that is he's very good. He has been raping for a long time. And he's very careful. He's an artist. He's very talented. When he rapes, he doesn't cause any physical harm. So this lady is being raped by this careful rapist, rapist and goes to the police and files a report and they catch him. So they have to, to decide what to do with him. So the police examines the lady. The police is very Cartesian. The police believes strongly that the body is simply something you have. So after examining the lady, they says, there is no physical harm here. Why, why are you complaining? Was it very painful? No, because the rapist was very careful. So what we do is we just find him, or perhaps we put him one week in jail, or find him five, uh, $50, and then we let him go. Because that is what we do with physical harm. Someone was punching, I think, punched some priest, and then he got, I think, one week of uh, jail. So I think that should be fair. If the body is only something you have, then a physical aggression in your nose or a rape would be the same. It is just an aggression to the body. And however, know how many ladies agree with that. How many ladies would accept such a ruling or such a treatment by the police? I hope none of you. And now, isn't it the reason for you not to accept that? that a deep violation of the intimacy of the body is a deep violation of the person and should be penalized more than physical aggression. Every country, every legislation in every country penalizes rape reasonably more than physical aggression because it is more, because the intimacy of the body is more than just the body and it stands for the intimacy of the person. So as I said, even if you don't want to accept this because you say, I don't want your ideas, you have to be consistent with that. And to be consistent implies that rape is just physical aggression. And you have to live with that and defend that in public, which I think is very difficult. Oh, feeling guilty will depend okay, of uh, your moral standards, for example. But it is uh, proven that if you were force your body to be closer than the language of the body admits, your body sends you a message. There is one theory of therapy that works precisely with this idea. If you want, I can give you the title of the book and the author of the book. I didn't want to put it here because, as I said, I don't want to bring too much, too much theory into this. Okay? The treatment went like this. This lady had been very promiscuous and she was having some troubles and then the, the therapist was asking her, uh, try to check your heart rate and your blood pressure when this friend of yours, same sex, so no, it's, it's not, it's not a, a, a someone who is, uh, she didn't know, so it was just a friend, just to check how the body reacts. And she was thinking that this is totally ridiculous. This is my friend, total strangers have been sleeping with me, so this is not going to affect me. So it turns out that it did. 
which precisely proves this point, that your body is sending you a message, and the heart rate went up, and the blood pressure went up as, as well. Even if she neglected or ignored these signals, the body was saying something. So what you say is, just like we feel uncomfortable in the bus when people are too close to us, those are signals, once again, the body starts speaking for you. Of course, to be surrounded by people in the bus is not something terrible. We are not going to die of that. But it means that the body is sending you a message. And that message is good to hear. So in that sense, yes, because the body has this language, it continues to send the message, even if you ignore it, or even if you think that it is totally ridiculous because you dominate the body with your mind. That's simply not the case. So that, as I said, if you want, I can give you the, the book and the author, because she has a kind of proposed a new kind of therapy for trauma, precisely that is what trauma is. That the, the title of the body, if you want, is my body, the body remembers. I mean, if, even if you, don't for, if you don't remember that something terrible has happened in the past, your body does. Maybe you press those memories into the, down to the subconscious, because you cannot deal with them, because your consciousness cannot deal with them, your consciousness cannot deal with them, but your body does remember them. Which, once again, stresses the point that our body is us. Remembers for us, speaks for us, and the intimacy of the body stands for the intimacy of the person. Um, it is 10 o'clock. And it is my duty to stop here. <laughs> so, I, once again, I want to apologize if you were expecting this to be a theology of the body. And I want to justify my position. It is much better to go to theology of the body after we go through the philosophy of the body. So, next day, it is not more, more about my ideas about the body and sexuality. It's about John Paul's second ideas. And I would like to present them as, uh, and to do honor to them as much as I can in one hour, which is not going to be easy. But it is a new approach altogether. But for now, I want to tell you that if we have a problem to understand the church, it has nothing to do with the church being inintelligible. It is not because the church is inintelligible. It is because we have belief from dogmas, without criticizing them. And with that, I think we should close. Uh, glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, it's now, and ever shall be, one without end. Amen.